Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be in God's house with you this morning. Amen. It has been a busy weekend for our church family. Our students have been at Disciple Now weekend over at Mount Lebanon with several other churches this weekend. And so they'll actually be getting back here to the church during the Sunday school hour. And you'll get to hear from them a little bit next week about some of the things that they've experienced and some of the things that they have learned. But I hope that you are in prayer for them throughout the weekend. We've also got a canned food drive that we are taking part in today. So hope that you have the opportunity to bring some things from home to give to Good Samaritans as part of their Super Bowl. There's a pun there, Super Bowl Sunday uh, food drive. But here in this hour, what we come to to do together is to worship. So if you are a member here, I am so glad to see you, so glad to have you here. If you're a guest with us, I want to issue an invitation to you here in your bulletin. Here on this green spot, there is a spot to fill out just a name, phone number, email, so that I have the opportunity to get in touch with you this week and so that you and I can talk a little bit just to welcome you to having been here this morning. Um, And so I invite you to do that so that I can get in touch with you throughout the week. It is good to see all of you here together and good for us to get to worship with one another. Let's stand together and let's sing.
Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to come into your presence and to lift up our worship to you, to lift up these songs of praise, to read from your word, and to grow closer to you in doing so. And so, God, I pray that everything that happens today, everything that we participate in together, would be to your glory and to your name. That you would have, Lord, our undivided attention and focus this morning. That we would bring before you all of the things that occupy our hearts and our minds today. That we would lay those things at the foot of the cross and we would fix our eyes on you. We love you, Lord. We seek to honor you with our worship this morning. Be with us in this time. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Stand again if you're able, and let's sing together, Trust and Obey.
scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, the first three verses. Listen now to the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and for this time. We thank you that we can come together and worship you in spirit and in truth to worship you through the lifting up of songs of praise, to worship you through the reading of your word. As we prepare now, Lord, to worship you through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, I pray that you would bless these gifts, which we now return to you, merely a portion of what you have gifted us with. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless the givers pray, Lord, that everything that we contribute this morning would ultimately contribute not to an organization, but to your kingdom, that we would use what is given today to share your love with our community and with this world. Thank you for all the ways you have blessed us, Lord. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to all of our musicians who have led us this morning. You may have noticed that Jeffrey was not here today to lead. He is in COVID quarantine right now. He, he is not positive for COVID, but he has been exposed, and so he's taking the necessary precautions, and so I'm grateful to Ken Camp, my dad, for stepping in this morning, and grateful to all of our musicians for leading us in worship today. If you've got your Bible, 
Uh, you heard the passage read just a moment ago, Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses. <clears throat> As we get started this morning, today is a special day. I, I referenced that it's the end of our Disciple Now weekend for our students. I referenced that it's the canned food drive for Good Samaritans. But outside of our church activities, of course, it is Super Bowl Sunday. There's the big game tonight between the Bucks and the Chiefs, and so I know a lot of y'all will be watching. But if you're watching, there's a good chance that it is not the game that you're the most interested in, but the advertisements. I've seen a couple articles this week that a few of the big companies that normally have a big Super Bowl ad have bowed out this year because of the pandemic, but nevertheless, the best commercials of the year are likely going to come tonight. The best commercials that we see all year long, the ones that make us laugh, the ones that make us think, the ones that make us cry. I mean, they're little mini works of art in 30 seconds. And so I was thinking about some of the past Super Bowl commercials, the ones that have really resonated with people, the ones that have stuck. And there's one that I wanted to show you this morning that relates to a way that we often read the Bible. So I want to show you all a Gatorade ad from a few years back. Brian, can you go ahead and give, me, give us that video, please? All you're missing sound-wise is a jingle. The images are what matter here. All right, thank you, Ryan. You saw it there on the hashtag at the end. The title of that advertisement and what you would hear in, in the jingle is this common refrain to be like Mike, to be like Michael Jordan. And you saw the images of kids trying to play basketball like him. And as the ad would have you to do, drink Gatorade, just like Michael Jordan drinks Gatorade. The implication there is clear. Drink Gatorade, you'll play basketball like Michael Jordan. That is how it works. That's a scientific fact. Everybody knows it. What I think is interesting, though, about the ad and about that tagline, it's not play basketball like Michael Jordan. It's not practice like Mike. It's not shoot like Mike. It's not dribble like Mike. It's be like Mike. It's not enough just to play basketball like the legend. You have to model yourself after him from A to Z. When we read through the Bible, it is tempting sometimes to adopt that same attitude to some of Scripture's most famous characters. To read the story of Moses and to draw the simple moralizing conclusion from the end of his story that what we need to do as believers in Christ is be like Moses. To read the story of courageous King David who was a man after God's own heart. To read through his life story and say what I need to do is be like David. To follow the same attitude with everybody from Esther, to Mary, to Peter, to Paul, to read their stories, to read their acts of faith, and to say, what I need to do is be like fill in the blank. The problem with doing that is that it elevates these men and women to a status that they were never intended to hold. The problem with drawing the simple conclusion that we are supposed to be like these biblical heroes 
is that instead of our purpose being to know and follow God, we reduce our purpose to simply following after some man or woman. The truth is that it takes more than copying somebody else's moves to fix what is broken within us. We've been talking all month long about the nature of humanity. That's this series we've been in since the new year began. We've talked about how we are created by God and created in his image, created with the purpose of displaying his glory to the world, reflecting back his glory to those around us. But we've seen how we as human beings are fallen, how there is sin in the world and sin in our hearts that separate us from God and that prevent us from carrying out our purpose. We've talked about how so often we place ourselves at the center of life rather than God and how often we are blinded by our own pride and our own fear. So this morning, if we turn to Genesis chapter 12, we see how God initiates a plan to solve this problem of sin in the world. He plucks from out of obscurity this man named Abram and makes him a promise. He says, go from your land, go from your father's house to the land which I will show to you. And when you do this, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you, and in you, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's this incredible covenant, which we see play out over the course of the rest of the Old Testament, and which in Christ we see ultimately fulfilled as we are given a new covenant in the blood of Jesus. This is one of the most important moments in Scripture. And indeed, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a more important moment in all of the Old Testament. This is a pivotal moment in the story of the relationship between God and humanity. So there's a question that you may have after reading this story and after dwelling upon how important it is. Why Abram? Why this guy? Why this particular man at this particular moment in time? What was so special about Abram that prompted God to choose him to initiate this plan of salvation? Is the answer to our problems, is the key to God's promises for us to be like Abram? If we can learn what made him so special, and if we can do what Abram did, Will that solve the problem? Maybe so. Let's, let's take a look at this man, Abram, and what could have made him so special that God would have chosen him to begin this covenant. Let's start off with his origins. We're doing a little bit of a character study of Abram this morning. Abram, we're told in the previous chapter, was the son of Terah brother to Nahor and to Haran, though Haran dies before the chapter that we're in this morning. We're told that he's the husband to Sarai, and notably, the father to no one. That'll be important down the line in Abram's story. So he's a husband, he's a brother, he's a son. We're told that he moves from Ur of the Chaldeans, which is modern-day Iraq, to Haran, which is modern-day Turkey. They were trying to get to Canaan, but didn't make it all the way there. 
doesn't really matter. That's not where he ends up anyway. God sends him in a different direction. This is the info we have about Abram moving into the story. This is his origin story. And that's about it. That's all the Bible gives us before God makes this promise to Abram. You'd be forgiven for thinking that surely you missed a page. That there's some more background info that we need on this man who was apparently so special that God chose him to begin this covenant. Maybe Abram was a king of some sorts, and that just got missed. But when you keep reading through his story, it becomes apparent that no, he meets a few kings, and when he does so, he is fearful, respectful, the way that you would expect of a commoner meeting royalty. Okay, well then, if not a king, then maybe he's some kind of religious leader in the region from whence he came. No, we actually don't know much of anything about Abram's commitment to God prior to God making this covenant. So maybe he was some kind of a social leader. Maybe he was beginning a movement there in Haran and God saw what he was doing and decided this is the man with the organizational aptitude and the charisma to begin my nation. I don't think so. Because when he left his hometown to go where God sent him, the only people who went along were his family. Strange. Because in a world where we so often judge people's worth by how many friends they have, we kind of just assume that God must have chosen Abram because he was really somebody in this world. But the truth is, human prominence has nothing to do with divine grace. Prominence isn't everything. I know that from the example of a film that came out just last year. I remember when I saw the trailer for this movie in a movie theater a few months beforehand. You remember movie theaters? Popcorn, all that? Oh, I miss it. I miss it. This trailer came on, and I was excited because this movie was based on an award winner. I'm talking about the movie Cats. Cats, which was based on the Tony Award winning Broadway musical, a musical so popular that it has yet to leave Broadway here several decades since its premiere. And I was excited when I saw the trailer because, for one thing, the, the director attached to this project already had an Academy Award to his name. He had won Best Director just a few years prior. And then when it started showing who the cast was, I was all the more excited because this was a star-studded affair. You had great actors. You had Dame Judi Dench. You had Sir Ian McKellar. But it's a musical, of course, so you don't just want good actors, you want good singers, and it had that too. Singers who were both good and famous. You had Jennifer Hudson. You had Taylor Swift. So I thought this movie was going to be a big deal. Really exciting. I was going to want to see this adaptation of Cats. Then it came out. And critics started watching it. And at least a dozen or so people went and saw it. <laughs> this movie currently, I checked, I guess it was Thursday I checked this, has 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. 20% of critics think this is a movie movie worth watching. And just for a sample of what the critics thought, this is what Peter Travers of Rolling Stone said. This all-star, all-awful screen take on the smash Broadway musical easily scores as the worst movie of the year and arguably the decade. I'll remind you, it came out in 2019, the end of the decade. 
But I mean, with that kind of cast, with that kind of studio backing, with that kind of track record, surely at least it was a very profitable movie. I mean, when you've got that many stars attached to a project, it's just going to print money whether the movie is good or not, right? Not so much. Uh, it was estimated to have lost $114 million for Universal Pictures. Despite the big names, despite the cast, despite the director, despite all the prominence attached to this movie, an all-star cast didn't equal a great movie. Prominence isn't everything. But ours is a world where that's hard to remember sometimes. Because in our world, stories like that of the Cats movie are the exception, not the rule. In our world, the bigger your name, the more likely you are to have it made. In our world, the more friends you have, the more successful you are. In our world, the more fame that you have, the more seriously you are taken. And so we can make the mistake of thinking that God plays by the same rules that our fallen world does. But from Abram's story, we are reminded that God did not call this man because of his prominence. And that he doesn't call you today because of yours either. Human provenance, prominence, has nothing to do with divine grace. So if it wasn't his fame, then surely it must have been his success. That must have been why God picked Abram. I mean, when you read further into his story, you do see that Abram, by the standard of his day, was a pretty wealthy man. But that doesn't quite square either. Because when God makes the covenant with Abram, the only condition of the covenant is for Abram to leave behind the land in which he had settled. He can bring his family, but he has to leave behind much of what he has built in order for God to bless him. And if he does so, God will give him the one thing which Abram does seem to lack. Offspring, children. In telling Abram to leave behind the land that had made him rich, and in promising to give him the one thing he seemed to lack, God pokes a hole in any notion that Abram's prosperity was important to God. The truth is, just as human prominence doesn't matter to the Lord, human prosperity has nothing to do with divine grace. Of course, we live in a world where human prosperity seems to be everything, where there is this expectation that you can have just about anything for the right price. You may remember in the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, there's all this, there's this odd cast of characters, these children each with their own fatal flaw, and one of the children is this girl named Veruca Salt. Love the names in that movie. Veruca Salt. And Veruca's flaw is that she is spoiled rotten. Anything she wants, her father buys for her. Anything she demands, she is given. So sure enough, she gets to go to this chocolate factory along with Charlie and the rest. She has one of the golden tickets, and she gets to see Willy Wonka's fabulous factory. Gets to see all the things that he and the Oompa Loompas make. 
and sees lots of things that she wants. Well, they come to this one room where there are, are these golden geese. And she sees them, and she wants one, because that is who she is. So she demands that Willy Wonka give her one. He says no. She turns to her father and says, Daddy, make him give me one. And so her father, to pacify her, to calm her down, pulls out his wallet and says, Okay, Wonka, how much for one of the golden geese? Willy Wonka calmly tells him that they're not for sale. There is no amount of money that will get him one of these golden geese. And Veruca just about loses it. We get this little song about how she wants it and she wants it now. And she and her father both are flabbergasted by the idea that their money is not enough to get her what she wants. Ours is a world that thinks a lot like Veruca Salt. That you can have just about anything if you're willing to pay a high enough price for it. That any possession, any privilege can be had if you'll just pony up enough change. That prosperity is everything. We live in a world that measures your worth based upon your success, that tells you how valuable you are based upon how much you have. And if we're not careful, we can start to think that God has the same value system that our world does. But here in Genesis chapter 12, we are told from the get-go, God doesn't call Abram because of his prosperity. And he doesn't call you because of yours either. Human prosperity has nothing to do with divine grace. Well, if it's not the prominence, if it's not the prosperity, it's one more option that seems to make some kind of sense. Abram must have just been a really good person. Just a very morally upstanding kind of man. Like his ancestor, Noah, a man blameless in the world. Maybe that was Abram's story. Of all the people in the world, Abram was the one who was the most on track with God's will. I mean, after all, when you flip over to the New Testament and Abram is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, we are told that he was a man of tremendous faith. We're told that he was a man who was obedient to God. When we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we find Abram right there at the beginning. And I mean, that's got to mean something, right? Maybe God just chose the best person for the job. I'll be honest, I've read the next few chapters. I hope not. Because Abram was far from perfect. When he and his family made their way to Egypt, Abram got worried because his wife was a very attractive woman. And so he told her, when we come before the king, when we come before Pharaoh, you're going to pretend that you're my sister. Because if he knows that we're married, he may just kill me. So he passes his wife off as his sister, and she is left to join the Pharaoh's harem. Not a good look for Abram. If you keep reading a little bit more, after divine intervention gets them out of that mess, when he and his wife start to get impatient with God not coming through on his promise 
of offspring, he and Sarai hatch up a little plan. They say, well, God must want us to take things into our own hands. So Abram, you will lie with your slave girl, Hagar, and in that way, we'll have children. There's some problems there. And then just as if this wasn't enough, there's a story a few chapters later where he and Sarah come before another king, Abimelech, and this gets me every time I read it. Again, he passes off Sarah as his sister. He does this twice in like six chapters. I don't know why he thought it was a good idea the second time, or, or the first time for that matter, um, but for some reason he thought this was a good plan. He thought this was something that would honor God. He thought this was the way to go. If Abram is our model for purity, well, then we are in trouble. Abram is presented in Genesis not as a flawless man, but a human one. Obedient at some points and fearful at others. Abram is far from perfect. And yet God chooses him anyway. Because the truth is, human purity has nothing to do with divine grace. I think that's a reminder that our world needs and that the church needs. That it's not just about being good. That it's not just about following all the rules that are given to us. That God's will is about more than just checking off a few boxes. That salvation is not dependent upon our works. God didn't call Abram because of his purity. And he doesn't call you because of yours either. Thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, God put in motion a plan to restore what was broken in creation. Through Abram, he promised that all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so we wonder what was so special about Abram. Why him? Was it his prominence? Was it his prosperity? Was it his purity? Was it something else that we're missing here? No. No. God did not call Abram because of who he was. God called Abram because of who God is. Abram's call, just like the call of Moses or David or Esther or Mary or Peter or Paul or anybody else you'll read about in the Bible, was a reflection not of human worthiness, but of divine grace. The truth is, we are undeserving of salvation. Romans 3.10 says that there is none who is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 tells us that all fall short of the glory of God. That all are sinners. But Romans 5.8 gives us the good news. That despite that, despite our flaws, despite our imperfections, despite our disobedience, despite our sin, God proves his love for us in that while we were still Sinners, Christ died for us. We are sinful. And yet, despite it all, God gives grace. So when you read this story, when you read the stories of any biblical character, the point is not, be like Abram truth is, you already are like Abram, a 
fallen human being. There is one thing, though, worth emulating about this man. The tie which binds unworthy Abram to the God of grace and God of glory. That when God called, Abram listened. That when God told him to go, Abram went. What is worth emulating about this man is not his prominence or his prosperity or his purity, but his faith. Because God offers you grace today. God calls you today. God gives you a model to be like today. Not Abram, but his eventual descendant. The fulfillment of the promise. God's son, Jesus Christ. You've been called like Abram. Now be like Christ. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for the examples of people in Scripture who are just like me. People who are not faithful in a superhuman kind of way. People who are not so much better than the rest of us. But people who are simply people fallen and in need of grace. So Lord, may we draw from these stories not that we must model ourselves after other people, but that we must receive the grace which you offer. May we give thanks to you for your mercy, and for your grace. I thank you, Lord, for the good news that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I pray that that good news would resonate within our hearts and within our lives, and that we would seek to receive what you have offered in Christ and to follow him to be like Jesus. It's in his name that I pray all these things. Amen. In just a moment, we will continue our worship with the singing of a hymn. If this morning there's something that you want for me and the other ministers on staff to know about, a decision that you want to bring to the church, a prayer request, simply something that you want us to to know about as your response to worship, you'll find a spot here in the bulletin. Just let us know what it is you're wanting us to know. Give us a name, give us a number. We'll give you a call this week to follow up with your response to worship. For now, let's continue in singing together the hymn. Let's stand and let's sing. Mm -hmm. 